welcome to another episode of Meet the Editor with CCI Journal. I'm Mervet al Asnaj, and with me today is Associate Ed Editor Robert Chilton from University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, Texas. Dr. Chilton, how are you today? Fine. Thank you very much, Mervet. You know, I really want to dive right into this and ask you that as a family person and as a clinician with on calls and patient commitments, time management, what is the time commitment for um, an associate editor and, and how do you ultimately manage the time between all of these? Uh, it's a great question. Um, fortunately for me, I'm not married and have no children. And so uh, does it take a lot of time? Uh, I think the way I keep up is read wide and read in your areas of expertise. Uh, and then uh, it gives me an idea of what to expect uh, and how to manage my time as far as looking at journal articles. I do have more time. No, there's no question about it. I mean, I, I finish my work and then I come home and I work again. Uh, you know, I don't uh, really do hardly anything on this at work because I'm in the interventional lab if that helps you a little bit. But I think for a single person, uh, it's uh, pretty strenuous. For a married person with family, it would be really hard. You would really have to be an excellent time manager. Uh, I do have hobbies, so I play basketball. So uh, I guess that's sort of equivalent to a kid. So again, in terms of looking at um, an AE, there's a big difference between an associate editor and just a reviewer of a journal. It really entails making decisions on the uh, publications that you get, but some of them do require intensive knowledge of statistics. And um, what are the kind of submissions that you think you cannot make a decision without referring to a knowledgeable statistician? Uh, I stay in the areas in my lane that I'm comfortable with. When I get outside that, then I ask for the statistician. Uh, which not infrequently I do. The ones that I really can't tell about are ones that are a lot of these open label or where they have multiple study groups added and they uh, layer. If it's straightforward, double blind, placebo controlled, no problem. Because the statistics, we've all used those for years and when we write papers ourselves, we use those too. Uh, but it's when you start adding lots of groups together, did you really take into consideration some of these other factors. My brain works more in a basic science view. My concern is sometimes we're not balanced on the basic science side. Uh, it's easy to see the patient numbers and what they have for risk factors. Uh, my risk factors extend beyond what normally people think about. So I do look at uh, actually genetic where they're coming from and stuff like that, because I know those are different. So if I have a question, then I will ask for a real statistician, not me. Again, following on the review process. So the review process really enta entails, it starts with the peer reviewers, but a lot of the time we find that there are polar opposite recommendations coming from the reviewers. So how do you manage that as an AE? I've got one right now. One says accept and one says reject. So which one do you like? I read them both. And then I kind of look and see what I think uh, I think it ought to be, which may not be right. And then, of course, the editor can look at it also. And we do have meetings that uh, we can discuss papers at. But I usually end up kind of in the middle, unless it's a very obvious glare. If it was an obvious glare, the guy who saw it the first time would have caught it. So he must have really thought it was pretty good. And it hit something in his pattern or something he likes. So... I end up probably someplace in the middle and may ask them to actually re-edit that part of their manuscript or check it. A guy that spends time writing a paper like you and me and everyone else that does this uh, has spent hours doing this. It is not easy to change your thought process and stuff. So it's going to have to be something I think is worthwhile. I do not think it's appropriate for people to say, I think you should edit 29 things. Come on. I mean, the guy doesn't write that bad. Just reject it if you don't really like it. But I, I really think you have to, the guy who wrote that paper did spend a lot of time, maybe a manuscript written by his house staff, but even then it took the house staff time. So I'm kind of careful when I say I'm going to reject something. It's got to be pretty bad. You know, moving now to 2023 in the era of social media, what do you think the role of social media is in publishing and consumption of science. 
Oh my goodness. Now you've asked a really tough question. I have this fight every day with my house staff. Uh, I call them millennials. And the millennials do not read the full journal paper. They only look at social media. The problem with social media, it's hearsay. And hearsay is not science. And you can uh, go down a rabbit's hole on that. You can also waste a lot of time when you should be studying other things. So I think the role of social media is, yes, it's a quick overview. It's kind of like looking at the very top layer. Uh, I think we're coming more to that. Uh, one thing it has done, and as you well know, as one of the people in uh, editorial role, uh, we are really having to look at honing down the manuscripts to where they're more concise and they're more quickly put on the social media. Uh, my, so the, my house staff reads social media 99%. That's how high it is. It's scary. Uh, we have board review sessions in the morning. They didn't see the original paper. They looked at social media and they pulled it or they pulled a guideline. We really do have to maintain those articles. If it gets to where people do not read the full print, then it's going to be kind of difficult because social media, is, again, it's a quick outlet. You can look a lot of nice things on there. But you've got to still read science and you've got to look at the hard data. Uh, and I don't know how I'm going to turn it back around to where some of them start reading the full paper, but they don't read the full paper. They read social media. I agree with you. Um, and I think uh, <laughs> yeah, a little problem. pushback on that. <laughs> Maybe with yeah, your own thoughts and so on. Um, so yeah. why they, but perhaps more importantly, is the field of interventional cardiology is very extensive and it's continuously growing. What are your particular areas of interest that you cover for CCI Journal? And let us know what to expect in upcoming issues in that respect. And, you know, sure. what topics do you think should be covered by the interventional community and need to be explored and haven't yet? Yeah, I, um, I, I think Steve put me on here for a reason because I do interventions, but my love is in prevention in basic science. I grew up in that. So I see us put stents in, I put valves in. I want to prevent that. I'm after the treatments that will stop the need for that and actually look at regressing atherosclerosis in inflammasome activation sequences so that we really don't have that inflammatory signal. Uh, when I read these uh, articles that come through from uh, the different people that are publishing, I try to find things that have a basic science twist that are going to help me for the next decade, not now. I'm not looking at now. I'm looking at 10 years from now. In our research development areas that I'm in, uh, we are looking at developing equipment that will not be available for at least 10 years. We're looking at actually gene signaling changes or some proteinomic signaling changes that will help you identify who's at risk so I can target that. And is it possible I can even modify some of the activities that would maybe decrease the amount of atherosclerosis and calcium and valve disease that we have? Certainly, uh, it will only be a small percentage. But if you don't do primary and secondary prevention, uh, people will continue to die as they did this year for the first time in the United States. We are dying earlier than we did the year before. Every country in the United States, uh, outside the United States, lives longer, not us. It's the first time I've seen that their parents are burying their children because the children got diabetes early. And so now you have a first time in society history that we have that. So in San Antonio, where I am, uh, it is diabetes city. It's like uh, I didn't used to see that. So I'm concentrated on vascular biology to a, a large extent. Uh, but I still work and run the actual interventional lab. And I do see that if I look at the patients coming in, uh, how many of them are brought to treatment that actually preventative level? Very few. I would suspect that you can find things they should have treated they didn't in 80% of my patients. When they leave, making sure they get some good information on lifestyle modification, although social media now is very touchy about saying that you're overweight, but, uh, you know, overweight kills. Those fat cells are your friends until you make them mad. But that's kind of where I start from and go. And I think it's important that we really go after the lifestyle and good preventative care. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chilton, for being with us today. And it was 
really great talking to you and the insights that you bring into this. Um, and the viewers, thank you very much for uh, staying with us on this episode.